Welcome to the Vault Podcast, classic music reviews, presented by IV Creative. Now, here's your hosts, B. Cox and the crew. Greetings and welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to another edition of the Vault Podcast, classic music reviews, presented by IV Creative. It's a perspective of the classics from a fresh point of view. We appreciate you for taking your time and lending your ears to our perspective. You could be anywhere listening to anything, but you're right here with us, so we thank you. With you today is yours truly, and with me I have my boy J.O. as always in the place to be. We're going to get here, get into the classics as we chop it up over the classics. Of course, our saying here at The Vault, classic music reviews is hashtag open the vault, hashtag nothing but the classics as we go over the music that shaped our lives, in particular the music of this generation. You want to go ahead and get into it. Jay, of course, appreciate you for having us here as always. Definitely appreciate you, you know what I'm saying, with the platform. So Yeah, indeed, man. And things are going well before, of course, we get started. I want to make sure that I give a shout out to all of our listeners, everybody out there on Twitter, listeners as well on Instagram, for always showing their love and for sharing the feedback and the word is getting around. Of course, we've had some new countries checking in this past week and over the last couple of weeks. Have seen, of course, a lot of love from the United Kingdom, as always, Canada, Germany, France, Poland, and of course, uh, Sweden and Norway. And even have a check in now from Tunisia over there in the continent, the motherland in Africa. And of course, shout out to all our listeners in Australia and the Americas as well. Big shout out, of course, to those in Asia, Japan and South Korea. Of course, things aren't always exactly kosher over there right now with this big coronavirus thing going on. Yeah, you got folks going crazy (laughs) out there, man. It's like ridiculous. So how about I went to, I don't know how many different stores. So this is what the stores are out of, right? Mm -hmm. The stores are out of hand sanitizer and they're out of everything, cleaning supplies, talking about Lysol wipes and Clorox wipes. So I tell people, right, you want to buy a stock, buy a stock in Purell. (laughs) (laughs) Whatever Purell their parent company is. These numbers this last month of the quarter are going to be ridiculous. Cause yeah, yeah, <laughs> like, matter of fact, the stock market in general, just like it was like last week before last lost like 1.7 trillion. Yeah, man. Folks going crazy out here. And then like to your point, yeah, I was at the store. I was at John um, last night and by the grace of God, I was able to get like a pack of um, Clorox wipes, you know what I mean? Like from, for my little one to make sure his, yeah. cl- his toys and crib and all the stays clean and everything. So yeah. who was, what else I see out there? Like, yeah, the stores were like the owl, I mean the um, shelves are bare, and then yeah. then on Amazon I saw somebody selling hand sanitizer for like ninety nine dollars. <laughs> like, bro, <bruh. laughs> I saw something on Facebook. Somebody had a little uh, a little baggie up in some. I guess it was maybe like some saran wrap. Talk about some <laughs> yo. I got that. I got that gram of that hand oh, sanitizer. Shit. Yo, I got that gram. Got them by the grams. <laughs> I ain't gonna lie, but if like somebody was gonna buy that, I, I'd probably do it too. Yeah, like, exactly. just, be, just be real. <laughs> yeah, man, water's been out too, man. I went by my grocery store the other day, and they only had the shorty waters out. All the other waters and Aldi were all gone, man. But that's that's what it is. We're gonna keep rolling on. So while you're either secluded in your house or riding around in your whip, make sure that you check us out, and we're glad that you have us playing right now. Nice now, way of saying quarantine. Of so. course, quarantine. <laughs> <laughs> so. We're going to get into it today, and we have an interesting project to go after, interesting project to review today. Today, we are going into Black Rob's Life Story, released March 7, 2000 on Bad Boy Records. Recorded between 1998 and 1999, the studio, you know where it was recorded at, Daddy's House in New York Mm -hmm. City, New York. Nowhere else. (laughs) Exactly. It's executive producers, none other than himself, Sean Puffy Combs, a.k.a. Diddy. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> aka the daddy the producers on here you know him well hitman Derek d dot angelique joe hooker amin Ra, nashi myrick six july yellow man yogi all the hitmen you could think about had a part in this project and of course black rob himself was a later addition into bad boy in the 90s was uh you first heard him on the Come See Me remix with 112. Also right. heard him uh, on a few tracks as well on No Way Out, which was Puffy's debut album on in 1997. And you continue to hear him on Mace's Harlem World and then eventually started to hear him more and more. And then right around 99, 2000, you started to hear the first track, which is actually the last track on this album, I Dare You, which was on the Slam soundtrack. Oh, yeah. And then he dropped a heater of a single with Whoa. 
in spring 2000. And, and uh, it was it really was. And that was the one track not produced by one of the hitmen, which was by Buckwild, of course. Yeah. So but Black Rob, definitely an intriguing story. He uh, had actually done a bid. He was actually in, uh, in, in prison for a while. After he was released from prison, he actually got onto the rap circuit and was co-signed by none other than Biggie himself, who Big uh, B- Black Rob as a young artist was co-signed by Biggie and Biggie sort of gave his skills a co-sign and also an endorsement. Right? Wasn't he on um? Wasn't he on the Life After Death album too? Did he? I could have sworn like he had a. Yeah, I, I could be mistaken, but I could have sworn like Black Rob had a verse on one of those songs. Yeah, right. actually, he was. Um, well, he was actually on Born on Born Again. Okay, but he wasn't actually on Life After Death. But he was on. He did have a spot on Born Again, and it's a shame that he actually couldn't actually couldn't be on a track with Biggie, yeah. considering his skills. But Black Rob's life story, like I said, released March 7, 2000, 20 years from now since this came out, and um, it's just interesting. We're going to sort of get into it. So I'm going to get into as far as Jay, your first reactions when you first heard it, and. Uh, <laughs> what your reactions were then versus now listening to it, re- getting ready to review it this week. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So I, I remember um, early 2000, yeah, I was still going to Lincoln University and, you know, the giant, the single Woe, it dropped and it was like a, it was definitely a heavy, a heavy rotation, like all the college parties and all like that stuff. And especially like, you know, it might be the same now as far as like, you know, when you get, hi- you get hyped when your city gets shouted out. So that probably was like, Niggas getting done in DC is like whoa, whoa. like we put extra bass style voice. You knew we were up in the party, like indeed, yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. But like, um, as far as like the lyrics and just the production, I mean, the production was just, I don't know. I think I, I feel like it's it's like wine. It's just like aged better. Yeah, you know what I mean, like I didn't appreciate the hitmen to to the degree that I do now. You know what I mean? As far as like their quality of work, mm-hmm. so now I go back and revisit. I'm like, okay, yeah, this thing, these tracks are definitely aged well. You know, they, you can still bump them wherever and. Along with that, Rob's storytelling ability, which, and like going back to what you said, it's kind of a shame that him and Biggie couldn't get on one together because you had two great storytellers right there. That would have been a great opportunity, you know what I mean, for like a, a concept. But yeah, his storytelling ability as far as like bringing that emotion to those tracks and and the collaborations as well, man, everything, it just fit together, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. And honestly, post Biggie, you know what I mean, because that was like a big a big concern, like, you know what I'm saying, after Biggie's untimely demise, like, you know, would Bad Boy keep up that momentum, which they did in 97, but 2000 was still kind of questionable. Yeah. So uh-huh. I, think, I definitely think uh-huh. Rob held the torch, so. Yeah, no, definitely. This was my senior year of high school, and I remember when this came out, it was crazy. Well, first of all, I think people kind of clowned the track well mm-hmm. at first because it was pretty much he was saying the same thing on every <laughs> line. But then when you broke down, broke down the song, and first of all, the beat, is incredible mm-hmm. to me. I think even now, when you hear that beat come on, you know it's like it's on. And especially when that, especially when that bass drops with the kick. Yeah, like, uh huh. <laughs> when Boom. you when you hear that, the produced of course by Buck Wild, who did his thing on this. But when you get into like what he was saying on the track, and even now when you play this in a party of a cer- of a crowd, either of a certain age or of a certain generation, mm-hmm. they still go crazy over this joint <laughs> because it still bangs twenty something years later. But one of the things that I Remember, listen to this is that one Rob storytelling. He had great lyricism. He had a very good voice um, that really portrayed everything. And it carried over because you were able to see that grit and that grime and the story that he had to tell that really came through in a lot of these tracks. Listening to it coming up, I did a lot of reflection on this album because I started thinking about, damn, man. Like, if you think about the roster that Bad Boy had post Biggie. Yeah. And they had the locks. Mm -hmm. They had Mace. They had Black Rob. They had Sean. Right. Okay. Now, four very, or to their core, originally very gritty, raw mm-hmm. lyricists yeah. that could tell some great stories, that could make some great songs that were street. All four of them, you put any Definitely. one of them, the locks, either collectively as a group, and all three of them, Sheik, Jada, and Styles, very gritty and raw street wilds, great lyricism. Sure, I mean, um, 24 Hours Live, that was a great, that was a great example as <laughs> you, far as like how you, it was all. You were there with me, you know what I'm saying? Because that's what I was thinking about going through, and I had to go back and listen to Harlem World again, which came out in 97, 98 mm-hmm. with Mace. And you looking as well, with Mace at his base, being a very gritty, raw street rapper, right. lyr- lyricist. Murder and, Mace. Yeah, <laughs> Murder Mace, you know, when, when, when he was first out there looking at Black Rob and the grit that he brought, and then an artist like Sean, who despite all the things people say that, you know, oh, he was a Biggie clone. Right. But then when you sort of got into Sean's debut 
project, you started to see there was a lot more behind just the voice that you thought was just him being a Biggie clone. Yeah, I definitely, and, I definitely remember those those Morgan days, you know, yeah. I mean? like with the Baron Salih, yeah. Train Whoa, and then like that's Gangster, which was on BT Uncut. Like, yeah, that video, man, like, yeah, Bad Boys <laughs> and then Bonnie and Sean. Right. Yeah, it's, it was it was bangers. So one of the things though, I do have a problem in listening to this album mm. is that I was always very struck with Diddy and how he took those artists, Locks, Mace, Black Rob, Sean. And everybody, as the formula he took with Biggie to try to say, all right, Playboy, I understand. You know, that's Diddy's word, Playboy. Yeah. All right, Playboy, I know you want to do this gritty and street stuff, but we got to have stuff for the radio, yeah. you know? He perfected that formula with Biggie because the radio stuff came across where it wasn't corny and it was still hard, you know? Yeah. And it had that commercial appeal. I don't think he did that as well with some of the other acts after that. And to me, I think one of the drawbacks I have with this album, listening to it this week, is that I noticed that some of the lowlights, at least on this album to me, mm-hmm. were things that is, it sounded kind of corny. Because when you got street guys that are rhyming, right? Right. That's their appeal. And you have to have some sort of commercial viability. I mean, every single one of them have a commercially viable single. The Locks with Money, Power, Respect, Black Rob with Woe, Shine with Bad Boys, with Bonnie and Shine, where it didn't necessarily seem corny. But then sometimes you get into these deep album cuts Mm -hmm. and you're like, what the hell were they thinking? And that's what I thought in a few tracks here. Okay, (laughs) I I, I ain't going to lie. Like when you say like as far as like corny and yeah, I mean, it's not so much with the Black Rob album, but it's maybe (laughs) schmaltzy. No, not that. Okay. um, I got to say with (laughs) G-Dep. Yeah. Be honest with you, like um, make this money, take this money. Like. (laughs) I mean, just like, okay, yeah, I know the Harlem Shake, the original Harlem Shake. The not original the, Harlem not, Shake. Not the one that's gone viral <laughs> exactly. and all like that, but um, the one that came out originally, that was popping and everything there, but just the fact like so many people were clowning that song. Matter of fact, I, I think it had like worst verse of the year in the yeah. source. <laughs> back when that meant something, children, yeah. back when it meant back something. Back when it meant something, yes. Yeah, before Benzie, you know, fucked it up. Yeah, exactly. Say, say whatever, fight me. <laughs> all right, but, um, <laughs> but yeah, so like, it just makes me think about that. I mean, yeah, it was radio friendly, but that's one of the examples I thought like, kind of came across corny, in yeah. my opinion. Yeah. And I do have a low point on this album for me. I don't think it, it really pertains to the the whole matter of like it being radio friendly, but I'll, 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 I'll talk about yeah, that. In a yeah. It's just to me to think about the, the roster that he had with the rappers at that particular time. Mm-hmm. And what makes them great is that gritty storytelling street stuff that has a lot of appeal amongst the wide hip hop audience, mm-hmm. but then not to dumb it down so much. And then we see, that's what happened. Mace left the label. The locks left the label, went to Rough Riders. Mm-hmm. We already know what happened with Deshaun's situation. Right. <laughs> so, but then I just think that's just a part of uh, Diddy's mismanagement on some levels when it comes to some of the artists that weren't named Biggie, mm-hmm. that yeah. he didn't really necessarily, like, he's almost like he exerted too much of his influence. It's almost like, to me, I think he got too much of a big head. And said, all right, I took the most gritty street dude out there in Biggie and turned him into a ladies' man. Right. So I need to see what I can do with the rest of these dudes. Yeah. And sometimes you just got to – sometimes you have to let – the mix doesn't need extra seasoning. Sometimes it's mm. just the right mix yeah. and then let it go in the oven and cook. Yeah, I, I, I agree. Like, I mean – Okay, I mean, I understand the formula as far yeah. as like having a radio-friendly joint. I mean, yeah. other artists have done this too. But yeah, indeed. Like – Okay, even with the locks, you know, I mean, one thing, one of their low points, I'm pretty sure everybody knows about is like the shiny suit thing. I'm not oh, sure yeah. how much of an influence did he have. I'm pretty sure he could have stopped that. Yeah. I think so, but I think with Mace, it kind of like worked out a little bit better. Yeah. As far as like going from like street to like street children to corn. Who yeah. Are phenomenal. Don't get me oh, wrong. Oh, absolutely. But you know what I'm saying? His work better. I mean, I don't think, I think with Black Rob, yeah, Woe was a great radio singer and all like that, but as far as like, Potentially transition into like that level, like how you did with Biggie and Mace. Yeah. I think I think it could have been left off the table. Left off the table, indeed. Same mm-hmm. with the locks, you know. What indeed, saying? no doubt. And G Dep, I don't even know why he tried, but um. <laughs> <laughs> it's crazy, man. G Dep is an interesting story too. I mean, by he the has, way, he has way bigger problems right now. Oh, I'll say that. So he's got problems for the rest of his life. So, yeah. so we'll get into the album, sort of understand like the highlights, any lowlights, and something that stuff you appreciate more so now. So I'll get into your highlights and any lowlights that you had in regards to life story. Okay, yeah. So I mean, highlights. Um, like we already said, "Woe" was a banger, mm-hmm. and actual title track, "Life Story." You know, what I mean, like just that beat, the way it comes on, like how the beat makes you feel emotional, and just the lyrical content of you know him explaining his his um upbringing and yeah. like what molded him into the person he became and why he was doing the things he was doing. So, 
that was a great you know um track or highlight for me um i would also say and this is one of the ones i was saying i think before we got on here as far as i heard on the mixtape first to drain jasmine yeah like i love that i love that um seals and cross sample and like, and like that caribbean aspect with the um steel drums yeah and like steel it just, drums yeah it just came together so beautiful and then like you know just the way the story the story was how crazy it got like progressively i'm mm-hmm. thinking it's gonna like stay in a hood story but like you yeah, was talking about Jasmine dancing naked with three news and yeah. like I'm, I'm like, dude, what the hell kind of chick did you find? Like, yeah. you know what I mean? So Yeah, that that story, the storytelling on that and the story was crazy. Cause right. it's like almost like if you was watching a movie. Right. Like that movie has that damn plot twist. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And the brutal death at the end, like, damn. Right. Like yeah. one of those things you watch and you can't speak for like a minute or so, like, damn, right. that shit just happened, dog. <laughs> and then and then um another high point is um looking at us with my man CeeLo Green. So like mm-hmm. I just love that. I just love it when like People break that barrier thinking like down south can only be down south. Mm-hmm. Where CeeLo came on here and shine. Like, I've also seen that before, like, you know, with people crossing over different genres as far as like West Coast hip hop, down south, whatever. Like, mm-hmm. it almost kind of reminded me of like Red Man on um, MC8's um, Nothing But the Gangster. Like, they came gangster, in and, yeah. and obliterated that track. Let's and, just call it what it is. But indeed, yeah. CeeLo did it on this train. So, um, yeah, I dare you and you don't know me. I do like. You don't know me. Yeah, like. Um, Honestly, it, it kind of like that type of hook like with the whole Joe Hooker, that voice thing. Like, mm-hmm. I mean, it was, I'm, I'm, I'll be honest, it was an acquired taste to me, but then when I got used to it and like, acquired, you no, know, it started to make it more sense as far as like how it blended in with the track and how it was so different. And yeah, so I mean, I'll, I'll say, yeah, those are my highlights um, that I could think of at the, off the top. So mm-hmm. I'm pretty sure you might have some different ones or. Yeah. And any low lights for you? I hate to hurt your feelings when I say this, but um, for me, it would be Thug Story. Oh, really? Yeah, okay. I, I would personally, I mean, not that the track was whack. I just didn't feel it was necessary. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, certain classics I just feel should be left alone and left to their creator. Mm-hmm. And Slick Rick being who he is, I just don't feel it was necessary. I mean, it was well put together and all like that. I mean, he kept it the momentum, but like some joints, I just feel don't need remi- remakes. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? Like almost like Beyonce's Before I Let Go. I don't, it, it, it didn't sound bad. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? But I just don't feel it was needed. I don't feel it was necessary. Necessary to do so. Exactly. Yeah, so like some things I just think you should leave off the table, leave them alone. Exactly. Nah, I hear you. I think I have a different low light. But my highlights, of course, I did like Life Story. Well, of course, it's still a banger even to this day. Looking at us with CeeLo was an interesting track because that was a good storytelling track. And CeeLo brought an interesting mix to the track, like you said, mm-hmm. bringing that thing in the method of, of an artist from down south. True. You don't know me, of course. I like that. Can I live with the locks? Yeah. And you know it's bad when Rob got the worst has the worst verse on the track <laughs> <laughs> because the locks killed it, man. Jada Sheet and Styles killed this track. I mean, just the way just the way their formula works. I mean, like yeah. just all them individually. And um, they got that how Jada and Styles got that back and forth flight mm-hmm. type of. I mean, just yeah, just, just perfected that. Perfected it. Yeah. yeah. I also liked Br, which to me I think I think that's the best beat on this album by D Dot. I that agree. <laughs> I agree. that sample, that vocal sample, like yeah. I don't know where in the world D Dot has pulled some rabbits out the hat of some of the things he has sampled and the beats he has made. Yeah. I don't think he gets a lot of credit as you sort of loop him in with the hitman because they were a team, they were a collective, and rightfully so because they crafted pretty much the bad boy sound over the better part of a half a decade into a decade. But that beat for BR. It was like that haunting sound of that yeah. sample. And it was like, oh, my goodness. And, you know, G-Dap was on there. And I know you're not a fan of G-Dap. But I thought G-Dap did a serviceable job on this track, man. Yeah, he was, yeah, he was decent on there. I mean, just like maybe this was before. Yeah. Because, like, <laughs> I don't before know. Maybe make this money. Yeah, before make this money. And maybe, and maybe before, maybe I don't know. Maybe, like, Diddy had, like, a talk with him after that. Like, yeah, yo, you got to, I'm saying, that was cool. But then. You gotta have some dreams for, for dream for, for the radio. The radios, and then, yeah. like, then we heard "Get Smack Silly." You get Smack Silly. I ain't gonna say the <laughs> fish and spaghetti and all that. Um, <laughs> before that, yeah, before that. Nah, I got you. I actually like Thug Story. I thought it was. I mean, again, it was a classic track. You know, like you said, Slick Rick having made that a classic mm-hmm. that's gonna be played for years and years and years yep. afterwards. I thought putting an interesting spin on it and sort of telling a story as well. Jasmine, he followed up with another mm-hmm. great story. Yep. And you just go there and listen to that track and you hear this, you know, the sound effects, Carl Thomas on the hook. Um, I Love You Baby was another thing that I sort of like because you're sort of getting everybody knows the story and stuff like that. Like, mm-hmm. you know, a chick pretty much giving you the whole thing about she loves you and cares for you right. and everything else. And it's just like, nah, no, you don't like <laughs> you, you know, that was done of course by Amin Ra and also wax Garfield for the hitman. And I dare you, 
uh, was something that we had heard a couple of years before the album actually came out, actually closed the album out. Right. Um, but really, I really, the thing that I like about it in regards to the tracks on here is that I think what the Hitman did, it was a good job of sort of crafting the beats that fit Rob on this album. And everyone sort of did their job from Six July to Yellow Man to D-Dot to Nasheen Myrick. I mean, they all kind of did their job as well. And as far as my lowlights, I actually did not like Down the Line because hmm. <laughs> I don't know whose idea it was to be able to start Diddy to to lead this track off. And I don't know who wrote that form. Or to have a full 16. Right, and to have a full 16. <laughs> but I don't know who wrote that form or whoever did it didn't do a good job. Like Diddy has... Has he's led tracks off before? Like one of the my probably one of my favorite Diddy verses it was him leading off on Young G's because I don't know who wrote that for him, but he did a damn good job yeah. on that verse. You know what I'm saying? I mean, that was a first of all that track. God, that track was incredible to have Diddy, Jay Z, and Biggie on there. Mm-hmm. Um, but I didn't like this joint. I thought Mace did not. <laughs> I didn't like his verse on this joint either, and I didn't like G Dep's verse on here either. So. I was not a fan of that joint. I also was not a fan of Espacio featuring yeah, Lil' Kim. I, I, I actually kind of like, like mentally blocked that out of my mind as far as a low point. I guess it was that low of a point for me. Yeah. <laughs> and it wasn't even a good verse by Kim. Nah. You know what I'm saying? And then the, the chorus and the hook was, oh, it's like this. Mm, never mind. So <laughs> PD World Tour. I wasn't really that big of a fan of Spanish Fly, though. I thought the yeah. Yogi did a good job with the beat there for, you know, they took that, of course, by La Isla, La Isla Bonita, which was a Madonna track. Mm-hmm. And But I, the J, J-Lo was on the track. The J-Lo and Diddy were together at that time. Yeah, so it made sense. He was like, yo, baby, come on. Like, yo, lace this track for me real quick for my man, you know? And But I wasn't really a big fan of it. But other than that, you know, I, I really do like it. The uh, of the highlights on here to me really stood out, and um, that BR sample actually was done was yesterday's by the Paul Chambers Quintet, so that's where that sample came from. Also, uh, that uh, "Looking at Us" by David Axelrod, mm-hmm. "Can I Live" was within the sound by Rasa. So there was a lot of good things here that you know that stood out, but those were the low lights to me. The low lights to me, I think, which is really kind of what stand out to me, because to me, when the album is good, when you have bad things on it, that to me even stand out more yeah, so than like, the good things. And it's like the bad things are to me are really, really bad. The, yeah, that's what makes yeah, like the the badness of it like really just mm-hmm. stands out from amongst like just like the good quality here, which has been consistent for whatever whatever point up in the album. Yeah, you hear something like like, you know what I'm saying, Spacio or something like that, then it's like, oh, man, like, why'd y'all put this on? This could have been left on the cutting room floor. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, I know, man, like, oh, it's just like, that's the thing that kind of stands out to me more. So what I will say is this, considering the time and space that they were at, I kind of think that this was Bad Boy starting to rebuild itself after Biggie's death. At this point, they were sort of going through a transition. And you started them getting into OK into that early 2000s. And I think they, they did a good job of building themselves back up with Rob and then also with Shine. Mm-hmm. And then, of course, they had some good hits from 112 and Faith. Right. But then it seems as soon as they got into the early 2000s, things started going downhill again. Yeah. I think, uh, yeah. Carl Thomas did his <laughs> thing. Carl like, Thomas. As a, as a solo artist. As a time, solo so artist, like, too. And then like that. But then as soon as they got into 01, like you said, with your boy G Dap. <laughs> I mean, they did. I mean, I, well, well G Dap wasn't on. They had the joint, We Ain't Going Nowhere. Yeah. I mean, that that was James a banger. And yeah. Then, um, Roll with me where um, it was Diddy and Eight Ball MJG. MJG. Like, yeah. I mean, and you love the track production is solid, but like, I gotta be honest. Like, I really, I really feel like Eight Ball MJG were holding back on that track. Like, yeah. Because they've snapped way harder. Like, like, we and we've heard it. Yeah. So like, <laughs> I mean, it's like you know, so like you could tell, like you could tell they want to go harder, but I don't know if like. Did he made him suppress that or whatever? But yeah, that's when that was that part of that Bad Boy South movement. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah exactly. And then, and then that's when they, I think Bad Boy sort of picked back up when they started to, um, when you started again. Because then you know, did he started the whole making the band thing? They had the band, right. then they had Danity Kane and Dream and you know, all those different things that sort of Bad Boy could throw away. But then you find gems like that Bad Boy South, and you see Eight Ball and MJG with two really really big hits off of that thing. Mm-hmm. But it, to me, I think they kind of, they started to fall off once the later on into the two thousands, but. Just to get into like lo- life story and any notable quotables that you may have had. So we're going to go into notable quotables now. I'll actually go ahead and start with mine. Yeah. And my notable quotable to me was I love BR because, again, I love that beat by D-Dot and the way that Rob sort of started it. He had some really, really good like punch lines and some good lines in there. So when he came out, 
It was just like, hey, yo, was killer, be killed. My skill, leaving them chilled on ice like Vincent Price. When I flash my steel, they can't touch. Won't touch, never touch. Drive around in the toastly wet, never bust. Puffing dust like fiends, I mean, I want the green, you shifty. Cop the big 850 with the gleam, my team. Full of cutthroats with enough notes to write a fucking book. Take a fucking good look at these bad guys. Stay mad fly and mad high in the Ford Expedite. And I don't expect to die on some humble shit. I am on some rumble shit. When it's on, you should see the shit that I come through with. If you're scared, dog, by release the four by fours. I heard the faggot ass Dawn died and he's shit in his drawers. <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> like those bars and that beat just fit that completely, yeah. like just fit it really, really well. And that story that he was sort of telling there, you know, a lot of those songs in there are fit with these same type of lines. And those beats just fit them perfectly. That's what I think was the high, a lot of the highlights of this album. So that was a, a you know my, my notable quotable. I want to see what you got for yours. Yeah. So I mean, um, going back to what I was saying earlier, I mean, just like, and I I didn't make this point earlier, but the actual title track, life story. Mm-hmm. Uh, I would have to say like the, ver- the second verse. Check the skit. Nobody never gave me shit. If anything, a nigga framed me and made me get mm-hmm. three to six. My first bid, no doubt, up spot for had to be twelve. Son, trying to make a profit. Remember, remember, brought my moms with no guilt, eating pork and beans, old cornflakes with no milk. You know what I mean? Like, mm-hmm. and then um, the other thing that just, I was, I guess it wouldn't be a quotable, but just like the way it was so, it covered both aspects. Like, cause he was expressing all this stuff. Like, you know, his mom, his mom he felt like his mom wasn't there for him. Mm-hmm. And then like um, Cheryl Pepsi Riley, and I forget who, who else was on the um, hook. And Raquel was like, like, you don't know how crazy I'm so sorry. And like, you know, mm-hmm. it's almost like an apology within that song. Like he's expressing himself and his mother's yeah. singing back to him. So I just thought that was just beautifully done. But like, yeah. And like the whole part was like, um, what was it was another part. It was like it was a bummer rocking shit. I rocked all summer, you know. Mm-hmm. Kind of put you back in the mindset, you know, like you started the school year off, you want to get f- had fresh clothes, fresh clothes. Maybe not the most expensive stuff, but like looking fresh, you know, yeah. stuff you know never rocked before. But like, so for him to go through that type of poverty and mm-hmm. how it shaped his mindset, I mean, it just really painted a vivid, fi- a vivid picture. So, I think that's his gift is the fact that he painted a vivid picture of how bad his life was and you being able to see and actually feel sort of travel with him through the time, the stuff that he went through. You could really hear, especially in that song life story that some of the things he went through in, in his crib and the stuff he went through with his mom, mm-hmm. you know, it, it's a formula that a lot of rappers have actually used throughout the years. Mm-hmm. And he did a masterful job of actually, actually carrying it out. So a lot of different other quotables that are on here, again, Rob had the gift of being able to tell these stories and it would have been great. I think to be able to hear shoot, him and Biggie on the track together, the fact that you could have, even if you had the two of them sort of talking about a song, like I always listened to this, I was like, damn, I wonder what it would sound like if we were to have Biggie and Black Rob on a track together and the two of them talking about, you know, a similar situation, the two of them together on a mission right. or a caper and then Biggie telling a story from his advantage and then Rob going to tell the story from his advantage and then having the two of them go back and forth on the third verse. That would be dope. <laughs> that would be dope. <laughs> like, that would be like, damn, yo, if you could just hear like those two just prolific storytellers be able to go and do some stuff like that, man, it's a shame that it never happened. But I mean, like, yeah, like, cause, um, it, like the way you described it, it makes me think about the, um, the dream body in the trunk. Yeah. With, um, Nas and Nori. With Nas and Nori, yeah. So, I mean, if them two could pull it off. I know Biggie and Black Biggie Rob. Biggie and Black could have pulled it off, exactly. Uh, just to go a little bit as far as the reception on this album. Now, there's a lot of interesting. We've talked about the source, right? We've talked about how they've had some major hits. We They've gotten the ratings right. Mm-hmm. There have been some major misses where they've gotten the ratings horribly wrong. Yeah, okay, yeah. One, yeah. one of the earlier albums we talked about, our first of the year actually was one of them. Was The Shining by yeah. Smith and Wesson, <laughs> where that only got three mics. <laughs> and looking, of course, on social media, because I follow them, I see just how big worldwide, mm-hmm. how big that release is. Because you even told me they're going to be in Baltimore later yep. on this month. With Rock with Rock uh, Rockness Monster. With Rockness a, Monster, exactly. See, I'm, so, I'm, I'm, I might get to slide through there. I'm, I'm thinking about it, man. I think I might have to do that. You know what I'm saying? So, but, so this album in the source actually got four and a half mics. Hmm. And... I, uh, uh, <laughs> it actually got four and a half mics and I'm like I think I actually even remember the source issue that this came out I where they gave them four and a half mics I kind of remember it's like I could see it but I can't see it in my head but I do, I do remember like reading the um like that issue and like you know the 
reviews of it, so it's kind of a blur, but like I'm st- it's starting to come back to me a little bit slowly. Yeah, just so that you get an idea, other four and a half al- albums that got four and a half mics were only built for Cuban Links, Death Certificate, Southern Player Instinct, Cadillac Music, mm-hmm. KRS One's actually Boogie Down Production, Sex and Violence got four and a half, which I don't agree with at all. <laughs> um, but there's a few others, so it's it's kind of interesting. I think, uh, yeah, I think Daylight got four and a half. Daylight um, got stakes is high. Stakes is high. Yeah, so it's just interesting that that was the thing. But this was did get some very good reviews from a lot of people. Um, the Rolling Stone gave it a good one's vibe as well. Said you know it's incredibly adept uh, by Miguel Burks. It's incredibly adept at construction graphic, autobiographical episodes, and intricate tales. So it, that's one of the things that this stands out on. Now the four and a half mics. Mm, I don't know. I really don't. But so we're now we're going to get into it. It's the ultimate test, the test of time to see whether or not what kind of classic this is. And so I guess I'll start with you, Jay, for you listening to it, reviewing it, taking everything in consideration. What is it? Is it certified? Is it borderline? Is it just in its time? Mm, I'm going to have to say it's just in its time. Mm. Like, you know, because of the like, again, the tracks that were dope were dope. Mm-hmm. But there were some joints on there I felt they could have left off to kind of like Kind of diminish them Like how dope it could have been as far as like it being like a through and through Classic you know what I mean so yeah. like Yeah I'd say yeah I'd say, I'd have to say Like that so yeah I think I'm there with you I think it was A classic of it's time and I think it was A product of the time we are thinking two, 20 years ago 2000 you have to think About rap as a as a whole At that particular time the direction that hip hop Was starting to go into right that that was the in the period of what it was so i think this was probably more on the harder spectrum of things that were probably being put out at that particular time mm-hmm. in regards to especially for bad boy because this was probably the most street album they were probably right up there with the locks as far as the most street album that would be out there on that label so it was not as commercial as the others right. so i think people were sort of maybe listening to that and then reading some of the reviews i think people sort of took that in the vein of what else bad boy was doing at that time and saying like all right this is hard this is for the streets but I think, like you said, the the good songs on here are really, really good. But the bad ones are really, really <laughs> bad. bad. Yeah. <laughs> and I think you can't escape that. Like, uh, these, this down the line joint, Espacio, like, uh, PD World Tour, like, these things. I mean, these, um, they're really, really bad. <laughs> and that, to me, is unfortunate because I think if you left some of this stuff on the cutting floor, we're looking at a borderline slash certified classic right here. Yeah. And that's the bad thing about it. So a lot of great work on this album, but I do think it's a classic just in its time. I do think it's a good listen to from here to here, but I do believe that for me, there's too many skips in here to make it any type of borderline or certified classic. That's just to me. Yeah, and I mean, and I, I like I like that he kept it consistent with like the mad rapper dream. But I wouldn't say it was the best the best mad rapper sketch. <laughs> like I would say the best one was on um was on um, No Way Out. Oh, yeah. I think that was the funniest one. Yeah. <laughs> but, like, yeah, I mean, it was cool he was on there, but I think I don't think that was, like, the best mad rapper sketch yeah. that he did. That's another genius thing of D-Dot. D-Dot being the mad rapper. Right. For those of y'all who didn't know, that he was the mad rapper. But it, it's – there's too many skips on here for me to say this is a borderline, a certified classic. It's a classic in his time. But I do think it was a good album. I still think it's now something that you can still listen to. You can sort of reminisce about those early 2000s that – Bad Boy sound, especially of Black Rob, I still kind of always will lament to thank you if Bad Boy could have gotten their things together and if it wouldn't have been too much interference by maybe Diddy and their creative was trying to make get people into what they're not, mm-hmm. I still think they could have been well more dominant well into the 2000s as far as in the hip-hop arena. Because they definitely did it in R&B and they did it with entertainment, but with hip-hop, I think they sort of faltered a little bit yeah. when it came to things being hard. Because I think that was one thing with Bad Boy, with being able to get those hard street stories that they had crafted and being able to perfect with Biggie that they didn't do too well with everyone else after that. Mm-hmm. And some left and departed and went elsewhere, and some stayed on, and you know we know the story happened with that. Mm-hmm. But there we are, Black Rob, 20 years ago, life story. Go check it out. You can get it anywhere where you can find music and make sure you go give it a listen. Of course, that woe still bangs even to this day. You can hear DJs on their old school mixes now. You see my air quotes, old school mixes now, which is old school. For to tell you the truth, it's old school music. 20 years ago. 20 years ago, you can hear them playing that stuff on their old school mixes with club mixes, man. And again, you go into a room of a certain generation or a certain age and the room is going to go crazy when they hear that joint. So, But that is going to wrap up yet another edition of The Vault. Please more, make sure you check us out on our host, Podbean, vaultcmr.podbean.com. You can also check us out as well on our link tree on all of our social media pages. 
You can get us on Facebook and YouTube. Just search the Vault Classic Music Reviews. You can get us on Instagram at the Vault CMR Podcast. Also, make sure you follow myself, IG at its lesson and IV Creative at I V E C R E eight. That's I V E C R E eight. You can get our link tree to any one of those. All of our streaming platforms are available there as well. And you can get all of our social media channels. Make sure you are following us. We love to get the interaction from everybody on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Love the fans interacting with us and telling us how much they love the show. Everyone from United States to worldwide, keep on listening. We love it. We appreciate all the support for you. And of course, if you have a friend, tell a friend and make sure that friend tells a friend as well. Always want to remember to keep your headphones on and your music loud, but not too loud. And as we close, we like to remind everyone to dream big because dreams are the basis for creation. Always create, motivate, and elevate because you were never destined or created to stay stationary in this life. And on that note, we say peace. Thank you for listening and coming into The Vault. Please subscribe and follow us on Facebook at IV Creative and Instagram at IVECRE8.